this week on the Back Table Podcast. Those are the little things that can be difficult to learn in a situation where the, the child is desatting and you really got to get the farm body out fast. The attending's going to step in and take over because we're in a situation where we can't, like, you can't practice anymore. Kids in trouble, you're flailing, somebody's got to take over and everybody's in the room watching. So it can't be like, oh yeah, Dr. Johnson let the resident struggle while this kid crashed. Like no one's going to forgive you. So in that sense, like, sorry, all right, let me, let me just sit down for a second. <laughs> but in the lab, then you, you can do that. And even if Dr. Johnson sits down and says, hey, let me sit down for a second. Let me show you something. You could get another shot. We can just have you try again. We can put another farm body in to get you more practice. And we can do that as often as you want. Like we have four hours in the lab. And if we just want to remove farm bodies the entire time, that's what we can do. And there's no, the only limit is at the, some point the staff has to go home. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast. Here we are all about medical education and otolaryngology, and we've got a great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, quick introductions. My name is Ashley Agan, and I'm a general ENT uh, in Dallas, Texas. And my name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric ENT at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Ash, how are you feeling today? Feeling good, Gopi. <laughs> how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm very excited about uh, our guest today. I have Dr. Romaine Johnson. He is an associate professor of pediatric otolaryngology at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. He's the director of both the Children's Health Airway Management Program, CHAMP, and the Pediatric Voice and Swallowing Clinic. He is our airway guru and was my fellowship director, is my partner and my mentor. You may remember him on Backtable ENT Episode 5, Pediatric Tracheostomy, The Long Game, Episode 14, Quality and Safety in Pediatric ENT, and Episode 21, Airway Surgery, What's in Your Toolbox. He is here today to talk to us about the Airway Form Body and Open Airway Simulation Program at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for having me back. Great to be here. Great to see both of you again. <laughs> or hear both of you again. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into it, just for those of you know our listeners who may not know you that well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice? Sure. As you mentioned, I'm an associate professor of pediatric laryngology at UT Southwestern in Dallas. I've been here since 2006, right after I finished my fellowship at Cincinnati Children's. And I primarily focus on complex airway. Uh, I see kids who have tracheostomies. That's the majority of my practice. And then if you can imagine the problems that kids with tracheostomies have, I take care of those problems too. So subglottic stenosis, tracheal stenosis, uh, secretion control, feeding problems, aerodigestive problems. So that kind of feeds my practice. But the big bulk of my practice are kids who have tracheostomy tubes. So we wanted to um, talk today about simulation in uh, residency training, you know, and, and then get into the uh, airway form body and open airway uh, simulation that you've set up and built at UT. Why is simulation important? And I know you have a, a very strong interest in quality and safety. How do these things tie together? You know, that's a good question. I, I knew we were going to do this podcast together. And so I've been practicing in my mind, like, what do I say about it? And I think, you know, I want to start from the beginning and, you know, I've been at UT Southwestern since 2006 and there've been periods of times where I was the only airway surgeon and I had to try to figure out how do I teach residents to become good airway doctors. And there were other times where, you know, I felt like I was being the mean doctor because I had to really kind of uh, cr be critical to the residents about their airway skills, because, you, you, you know, for those who don't deal with pediatric airway, we're often presented with a situation where there's sort of an unknown unknown or there's a known unknown. So you'll bring a child in who has all the signs and symptoms of severe airway obstruction, but you don't know exactly why they have severe air obstruction. And you have to have a certain level of competence to manage the airway to prevent them from developing severe laryngobronchospasm during the case. You don't want to lose the airway during the case because the outcomes can be pretty significant. You can, you know, up to where you just got to intubate and they've got to be in ICU for a few days to a child having a major anoxic injury. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have those conversations no. with families. <laughs> and I realized that the residents didn't have enough experience to really take those operations seriously enough 
And I felt like I was constantly always bird dog. And I'm like, hey, man, you get, you know, you got to put the equipment together. You, you're not paying attention. Learn how to mask the patient properly. This is important. And I felt like, you know, I got one of the years I got feedback from the resident that said I'm kind of hard to work with. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm be, becoming the mean doctor. And I realized that you have, um, you know, there's a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talked about emotional bank accounts and that you make deposits and you make withdrawals. And I realized I was making a lot of withdrawals from residency education. You know, they would come to my room and they would stay in my room. They weren't like avoiding me, but I really could feel that the room wasn't a place where they felt valued. And some residents got a lot of it, but a lot of them, I think, felt like I was just like kind of always over their shoulder, just making things hard for them. And then I understood personally that, okay, there's certain things I'm just not going to be able to change. Like I can't, I cannot like bird dogs you when it comes to these airways because we can't have a kid have a agnostic event. So I have to, to a certain degree, <laughs> kind of really be on top of you and be critical of you. But maybe there's a way I can create space where we can have more time to socialize, more time to talk, more time to learn in an environment where the stakes aren't so high. And obviously that gets into simulation. And I had done some simulation as faculty um, at a course I gave, a course I participated in in San Antonio, maybe 10 years ago now, maybe longer. This is probably 2008. And so I reached out to the people at San Antonio and they told me that they weren't doing it anymore. So I was like, okay, that's, that's shot. And then I, you know, serendipitously got an email from CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And they, this is an email they sent to everybody and they were advertising their annual farm body airway reconstruction course. And I believe Dr. Shaw, you've, you've participated in that course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I emailed the course directors, Dr. Duchitz, Dr. Ellen Duchitz, who is pretty world renowned is in, in terms of simulation and education. And then Dr. Karen Zur, who was a former fellow, of, a co-fellow at Cincinnati Children's. And I just asked him, Hey, like, Hey, can I come hang out? And so, yeah, I went hung out for the, it was like a Saturday course. And, um, I saw how they put it together and, and I said, okay, this is, this is potentially a good idea. So I came back to UT Southwestern and I worked with you, Dr. Shaw, we worked mm -hmm. together on putting together a curriculum. I had already had privileges in the animal lab because our, the simulation involves using, um, a live animal. And so I worked with the veterinarian and then we were able to put together a course and I, obviously we'll talk more about what the course entails, but that's kind of like how it started, how we got to that point. I think that's awesome to kind of hear that that backstory and and kind of understand how it all came together because it's true you know simulation is such a great way to learn any sort of procedural techniques that are typically going to be needed when the stakes are high and when you know it's kind of one of those situations where it's hard to practice because you know any an, an airway is a perfect example uh, a perfect topic for simulation so that you can try to develop those skills like you said, in an environment that's where the stakes aren't as high, where you can actually be like, okay, time out. Let's talk about this and practice it. And yeah, I think that's that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the the course. Um, it's live animal simulation as opposed to, you know, mannequin simulation. Why did you go that route? And then we can talk about how it's set up, I guess. So when I, when I went to the course at CHOP, they had both. They had some mannequins as well as some animal models. And that evening we had a dinner and the, they went through the feedback of the course and it was pretty clear. Everybody loved the animal model. They felt that that was the best way to learn. And intuitively it made sense because you can, it, you can simulate desaturations. Um, you can simulate uh, having to learn how to mask the patient or in this case, the animal. You can simulate having to be able to intubate quickly, uh, as well as the tactile sense you get of removing a foreign body in live tissue. You can see the swelling, maybe the bleeding if, if that happens, the difficulty of having to use different types of instruments in order to get a foreign body out. You really couldn't do that with a mannequin. A mannequin can sort of give you the basics maybe to, to get a feel for the instrument that you need, putting the bronchoscope together. In fact, initially, that's one of the things that we tried, taking the residents to the operating room and just have them practice putting a bronchoscope together, but realize that it's not the same as actually 
taking the foreign body out, you know, learning how to use a laryngoscope and things like that. So that's really why we started to use the animal model. It just, it provides much more of a global instruction uh, or feel for removing a foreign body or practicing, you know, airway management in, in, uh, in an emergency situation. Yeah, yeah. probably it's, it's simulate, it's more lifelike. It's, it's a closer um, and it is a life. Of what, yeah. 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 It yeah. is, right? It's a and life on the them. table. And you can hear the monitor beeping, beep, beep, and boop, boop, boop. You know, those those audio cues that you get, the visual cues, you can see the change in skin color. You also are practicing communication because you're working with an anesthesiologist, a veterinarian in this sense. And they're telling you like, hey, you know, the sats are dropping pretty significantly. We need to stop and re-intubate or we need to stop and mask. And then also other types of communication, if you're having trouble and re-intubating the patient, you have someone else who potentially could sit down and show, oh yeah, you, you've, you didn't lift up the epiglottis enough. And that's why. And so it's like almost immediate feedback as well. Um, and, and I think the feedback also is good. I, you know, the residents and the learners, they they enjoy, you know, working on the, the animal. I think the mannequin is not as good in, in that sense. And you guys use a pig for the animal, right? How did you choose that? I think that's a standard uh around the country the best, it pretty much approximation yeah, think, for the family. yeah they use piglets yeah and what's nice is there's a open airway pediatric surgical dissect uh, dissector book uh, written by one of our colleagues evan prost who i believe is in canada i want to say it sick kids yeah toronto's and he's yeah. also a former cotton fellow <laughs> and he was at the course in philadelphia at chop and he was one of the invited speakers. And so I bought his book. In fact, I bought several copies of the book. We have a book in the OR, we have a book in our little library, and we have a book in the animal lab. And it's nice because when we get to the airway reconstruction part of the course, if they're kind of struggling a little bit or they forget a step, you just take the book out and you can hold it up and say, hey, this is the next step. This is how you do a horizontal mattress suture. And it's not just showing them, but now you can show a picture. And also hopefully they remember like, oh yeah, there's a resource I can use for the future. And we actually encourage them to review the book ahead of time. We, one of the things I did was get the library to buy a copy of the book. So there's a cop, an electronic copy of the book for the library. So all our residents have access to it in the OR, in the lab, as well as on their own. And that's one of the things I think that I, you know, maybe the, a lot of people don't appreciate, but I think you should like it, putting the work in to get the, something like this set up. There is a lot of work behind the scenes. It just doesn't magically happen. You have to fill out paperwork to, to get permission. You have to write a budget and you have to submit that budget to people who have the money. Like, so we have to, you know, talk to the department chair and use some of our education funds to it. We have to buy resources. We have to periodically find out, okay, we need suture. We have to email the, the storts rep to bring in the bronchoscopes. So we can use them. Then we have to, you know, I'm always going to the operating room downstairs. They have retired instruments, you know, what they don't want to use anymore. But like, hey, can we, can we have them? Because we could use retired instruments for our lab. So there's a lot of little things that go on behind the scene that really make a successful course. Well, this is a good uh, segue into the Aya Cook. I had never known what the Aya Cook was. And my understanding, it's kind of like the IRB for research, but on animals. Can you tell us a little bit about the Aya Cook and the process of that? And so I, I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but you're correct. It's essentially the IRB for animal experiments or animal studies. And it's spelled I-A-C-U-C, -C, but everybody calls it Aya Cook. And it's a little bit different from the IRB in the sense that the way you fill it out, they have different requirements. You have to take different courses because it's all about the humane treatment of animals. And usually you have a veterinarian help you write the protocol and they'll send feedback and it has to be very specific. So when we did our foreign body, uh, Aya Cook, you know, we really had to describe, okay, are we going to use lidocaine? How much lidocaine? What happens if there's swelling? You know, do you expect swelling? What kind of instruments are you going to use? How many attempts of the foreign body are you going to do? I mean, we had to have that much detail. And then for the airway reconstruction, we literally had to say, okay, we're going to make a four meter, four centimeter incision. We're going to do this next. And these are the surgeries we're going to do. We have to provide each step of the operation. 
in order to get approval from the eye cook. And you also have to tell them, like, how many animals are you going to use? You know, one year we apparently we used too many animals. It, I don't know how we did it. Like it was like one too many. And I got a letter from the eye cook like, hey, you uh, you said you're only going to use 10 animals and you used 11. So you either change your protocol or, you know, shape up. And so <laughs> stuff like that uh, happens. Uh, but UT Southwestern is very good. You know, when it comes to education, it top notch. It's just, you know, once you, they're, they're like the veterinarians in the animal, in the, the, what they call the ERC, the Animal Resource Center, they've been outstanding in helping us uh, get our protocols through um, and, you know, helping us with the, I mean, they're very enthusiastic. They want us to do more. They're constantly like, hey, you know, when you, you want to do more, we have like six ORs. We can have a big lab if you want. And they have, they have a lot of the equipment that we need already. But I think the main take home from the eye cook is that if you're going to do any animal experiments or teaching with animals, you have to go through eye cook. You're going to have to do some training very similar to what you did for IRB. And it's just basically what are the humane, how do you treat animals humanely? You're going to have to coordinate your uh, study or your course with the veterinarian in order to get it done. And um, just kind of like getting into the details of actually how things are set up in the in the lab. Do you have a veterinarian that's doing your anesthesia for you? And what is it like? How many residents and attendings per patient? Like, what does that look like? So we initially started out with two uh, courses. So we we wanted to have a big course, like the way they did it at CHOP. And CHOP is Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So if I say CHOP, that's what I mean. So at CHOP, they they had a that big course and they had 30 residents or fellows. And it was an all-day affair. So initially we said, okay, we're going to do one of those, at least one of those a year. And so we have all our residents who could come and we'd have like five faculty. Usually we'd have about six animals and we would spend the first part of the morning doing lectures. And we'd have a lecture on airway reconstruction, on airway farm bodies and emergencies. And then we'd have an anesthesiologist talk about the shared airway. And then we would go to the lab and we'd break up in the teams and we would try to have, you know, at least one five, one four, one three at each station. So it's not like all R2s at one station, as well as an attending. And then we would just start practicing removing the farm bodies. The, the animal lab has uh, storts towers. So it's just like in the operating room. Uh, and we would just use pediatric bronchoscopes and we would usually have someone place the farm. Well, first we would have them practice, just get used to the animal's airway. So perform a direct laryngoscopy, have everybody kind of do that and just kind of let them know like the pig anatomy is a little bit different than the human anatomy. So you got to get used to the pig anatomy and then also get used to bagging the, the I'm going to say, sometimes I'll say patient, but <laughs> bagging the animal. And uh, so we'd have everyone practice that. Then we'd have everyone go in with the bronchoscope, just get used to how does the bronchoscope go in and out. And hopefully the animals still do it pretty good after all that. And then we would start practicing putting foreign bodies in. And usually we would have somebody more senior put the foreign body in, either the R5 or the attending. And, and when we eat peanuts, um, other types of foods, erasers, uh, pens, any, you know, any type of, basically all the stuff that we can remember removing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, I remember one time I removed this. Okay, <laughs> let's see if we could get that in the airway. Uh, and, then we, and then we would have the person who has to remove the foreign body leave the room. And so they would come back and it's like, okay, here's your patient. And then they would know to do the laryngoscopy, the bronchoscopy, and then they would hopefully identify the foreign body. And then they could tell us what type of instrument they needed to remove the foreign body. And the, the, really the two big distinctions are, do you use alligators or do you use peanut forceps? Uh, and we try to teach them when you use one versus the other. And then they go in and they remove the foreign body. And it's, it, so that's usually how the morning goes. I was going to talk about they're doing really good. I think the residents have come so far in their experience as endoscopists as a result of this. I hope it's a result of this course. I think it is because I feel like we've had some residents this rotation and even last rotation, you know, the, the academic year for well, the residency year starts in July. So I would say the last part of the last rotation, the end of the year and the beginning of this year, the residents seem like they're just much better at doing farm bodies and just endoscopy in general. They still have some bumps in a row based on their level of experience, but they just seem much better. But anyway, so they would do that. And then we'd have big lunch, kind of talk and chew the fat. 
And then we would come back in the afternoon and either they could do more foreign bodies or they could do the airway reconstruction. The fellows, we usually have them doing airway reconstruction the whole day. And then for airway reconstruction, we would teach them how to do, uh, it depends on the faculty, but usually LTP, so laryngotracheal plasty or laryngotracheal reconstruction with a rib graft harvest and teach them how to do an anterior posterior rib graft. And then maybe if there's time, teach them like a cricotracheal resection or a slide tracheal plasty. And then I would end the day and I'm always amazed it would be four o'clock and they're like, they don't want to leave. And I have to tell them like, hey guys, I, you remember there are people here helping us. <laughs> they want to go home. It's a Saturday. It's time to go. But you could see like, nah, they could probably stay another hour or two. Yeah. And what was fun about those courses, uh, the big one is that we also had our colleagues from UT Houston. We had Sean Roy come up, uh, Z Yang, he was one of our formal residents, uh, PD faculty there now. And uh, some of their residents uh, came up for a couple of years and our colleagues at Baylor would send their fellows as well as Elton Lambert would come up. And so it was a, a good, like, I don't know, maybe three or four summers where we were able to do this big course. And then, you know, in between, I think the second course Dr. Johnson's talking about is we do a smaller one once a quarter. So once a block for the on-service, the PGY 2, 3, and 4, and the fellow would have the same thing where we would go with one pig as opposed to you know, one station as opposed to like the five or six for a bigger one. And it's uh, the same exact setup where, you know, the anesthetized pig comes into the OR. You know, they've set up their bronchoscopes. They all, we all do a DL because the retinoids are big in the back and the, you know, a little bit more interior just to get that feel for it. Um, and then we, you know, all practice bronchoscopy and then all practice form body and then switch over to the airway. And so with the goal that by the time our fellow is done with fellowship, they've experienced this four times in a 12-month period. And our residents will have experienced the lab three to four times in their five years of residency, depending on, you know, how often they're able to come with the big one as well as when they're on service. So that frequency, I think, is very unique. And it's probably why we see this growth in terms of skill and confidence um, when, you know, if I'm on call with somebody, you know, we have a, you know, two-year-old that comes in for an airway form body. If we've, I've seen you work in the lab, we've done it on the pigs together. I'm a lot less hesitant or stressed out if we, you know, that skill set, I've seen it. And so it makes them able to appreciate and also be more a part of when it, it is actually on a, a child that comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the residents like it too, that, that extra training, you know, it, again, it, the, the smaller labs are just an afternoon or a morning. It's usually just an afternoon, but it's, you know, it's not, they, I think they really appreciate just, okay, it provides good feedback to the cases they've done during the year or during their rotation. And they can now kind of ask questions and pick our brains. It's a, it's a much more relaxed environment. And I, I think that's so important because when the when the real cases come, sometimes you know, you've been in those cases. It's like, yo, get it out, get it out, get that far yeah. body out now. It's very intense. Sometimes you forget to hit the record button on the the video, and you're like, oh man, that was a great far body. Where are the videos? Oh, we forgot to hit record. Yeah. Like, and so, um, and like I said, I've seen the growth has been really tremendous. Uh, I feel like this cohort of residents this year have, you could see that they're just much more comfortable doing bronchoscopies, you know, turn, yeah, just simple things like turn the head to get into the main stem bronchus, simple stuff like that. You don't have to constantly remind them anymore. Yeah. And how important do you think frequency is? Because for me, um, in my residency training, we were, uh, we, I was in Philly, which was nice. We were able to do the CHOP course, uh, probably, you know, maybe twice, uh, two years in my five or maybe years there, maybe, because I, I feel like I went once as a PGY2 and once as a chief. And so not every place, depending on proximity, resources, how important do you think frequency is? Yeah, it's very important. I think you should do it as often as financially, as well as, you know, often as is feasible. So you have to also remember that when you take time off from the OR, from clinic, that's time off from the OR clinic. And I have mixed feelings about doing this on the weekend. I don't think you should do more than one on the weekend because that's the resident's time off. That's also your time off. And you know, having that time to just relax and not have to be a resident or faculty is important. And so we try to do it during the week, uh, but that does mean you're cutting into somebody's OR time or somebody's clinic time. 
So I think, you know, once a quarter is pretty reasonable, but I think if you just do it once a year, you're probably not going to get as much out of it. There's just too much of a gap. Now, granted for some residents, they are only doing it once a year, but they get to do it again in the next year. They may do it twice. So I, you know, I think, yeah, so yeah, if you do it once a year, maybe that's enough. But I think if you, if you're going to try to incorporate everyone, then maybe at least twice a year, that's probably better. I uh, think about the temporal bone lab. I think most residency programs, if they have a temporal bone lab, they're doing it once a quarter, they're doing it probably either every quarter or twice a year, right? They're not doing their temporal bone lab once a year. So it's the same idea you're doing. It's a lab and uh, it's a little bit, you know, obviously using something alive. There's a little bit more precautions you have to take, uh, a little bit more cost, but doing it just once every now and then it's not going to be as effective. Yeah. You got to get those reps in. That's where that, you know, muscle memory and all that kind of stuff comes in. What about the communication and the thought process that is also happening? You know, obviously residents are getting hands-on, getting to practice, you know, doing those skills. But can you talk a little bit about the the mental part of it? You know, the ability to troubleshoot, which instrument do I need? And all those types of things and how that's improved. Yeah. So one of the main things is if once you see the foreign body, deciding how do you get it out. And really there's, there's two major choices. It's you use alligator forceps or you use peanut forceps. And then there's other little tricks you can use as if it's a difficult foreign body. We don't practice that as much in the lab. I was thinking recently that maybe we should, maybe we should get some uh, Fogarty catheters and some um, urethra, baskets. Um, urethral baskets and maybe at the end practice using those. But again, expense, like those things, they typically don't have uh, retired Fogarty catheters, like, so you got to pay for them. But anyway, so, I, you know, I think that's the big decision process when they go in to be able to decide. And then the other things is, is just, it's decisions that are, that are harder to teach. So if you see the farm body, what's the best way to grab it? And if it's positioned in a weird way, do you need to turn it and move it so you can grab it easier? If you're pulling out like a nail, you know, the way you grab the nail, sometimes it'll get caught on the, the subglottis. So do you re-grab it? Obviously, but you, you're kind of losing control of it. But yeah, sometimes you need to re-grab it. Do you pull the foreign body into the instrument, like the bronchoscope? Or do you wedge it against the bronchoscope and pull it out? I think those are the little decisions that they start to, you start to get better at. And then just that, my favorite expression, mechanical advantage, learning how you're looking at a monitor that's in two dimensions, but you're working in a three-dimensional world. So figuring out how to translate that two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional space and positioning your hands and your hand-eye coordination, as well as your, the balance that you have in having control over the instrument to be able to remove the foreign body or get the bronchoscope in the right place. Those are the little things that can be difficult to learn in a situation where the, the child is desatting and you really got to get the farm body out fast. The attending's going to step in and take over because we're in a situation where we can't, like, you can't practice anymore. Kids in trouble, you're flailing, somebody's got to take over and everybody's in the room watching. So it can't be like, oh yeah, Dr. Johnson let the resident struggle while this kid crashed. Like no one's going to forgive you. So in that sense, like, sorry, all right, let me, let me just sit down for a second. <laughs> but in the lab, then you, you can do that. And even if Dr. Johnson sits down and says, hey, let me sit down for a second. Let me show you something. You could get another shot. We can just have you try again. We can put another farm body in to get you more practice. And we can do that as often as you want. Like we have four hours in the lab. And if we just want to remove farm bodies for the entire time, that's what we can do. And there's no, the only limit is at the, some point the staff has to go home. And so those are the things that you learn. And then also, you know, you just start getting a feel for when every animal and every patient's ability to maintain their saturations is a little bit different. And some can take a beating and their sats just stay up, but others like by the time you go from putting your laryngoscope in to getting a bronchoscope in, they've already desatted and you got to bag them. And so just getting a feel for those, and it provides enough like real world tension. So their brains start to recognize 
when can you move slow and when do you need to move fast? And I think that's one of the hardest things I've, I still find teaching the, the residents is having them understand the difference between the slow thinking and fast thinking in the OR. And that for airway cases, it's slow. Like it's, it, even though the case is happening quick, quickly, it's still that sort of slow. The brain is very active. The brain is really paying attention to all the cues around you. You know, you could raise a, if you're doing a neck dissection, it's going to take you three or four hours to do. When you're raising this, you know, your apron flap, at some point it just becomes, you're not really thinking about it, right? It's just, that's what you do. You raise the apron flap, you split the strap muscles in the midline, you get down to business. But for a kid who has a grade three stenosis, and so foreign bodies can often stimulate that severe airway obstruction. There's no slow part of the case. Like once they give you anesthesia and they turn it over to you, like every step, like if you're not paying attention to bagging and the patient starts to deset, all of a sudden you're in trouble. If you take, you know, if you're constantly, if you put the laryngoscope in and it's always bleeding, <laughs> every time you do it, you're like making the airway bleed, that's going to create problems. So you have to really start this, you have to be on your, your mind's got to be sharp during the whole case because they're usually fast cases, but the, the margin of error is very small. And I think that's what the pig lab really offers. It just, it kind of starts with the animal, you know, we call it a pig lab, but um, that's what that foreign body simulation course offers. Just those kind of opportunities to, to just sharpen the mind. The other thing I, I appreciate is, yes, you get are obviously uh, really there to understand and practice the surgeon role, but we do have the resident being the OR tech, another team member. And even for the anesthesia part of the pig in terms of when to bag mask and who's watching the SAT, yes, the vet tech or veterinarian is there, but we do have a team member, whether it's one of us as staff or the resident who's watching that too. And so that I think, and playing those roles, I think helps when you are the surgeon in the room to kind of know what's happening in all perspectives and how can I, you know, prep myself and prep the room so that the case goes well, because I've thought about not just what I need in this hot seat and the surgeon seat, but okay, what do I need to make sure I need to have on my back table? What do I need to talk to with anesthesia? What do I want to make sure that they, I want to make sure that they have, or, you know, that dialogue and communication, you know, as you always say, tell us, it starts before the patient's in the room right? 90% of the case, or I'd say a bulk of the case is before that patient's in the room and then, you know, get everything that you need and then the rest of the case will happen. Um, but like you said, there's no time to go get that, you know, optical alligator that should have been on the table. So one of the things that we realize with the, with the lab course and they're working with everyone and removing foreign bodies is you start to see, well, what don't we have in the main OR? And so that's help that's hurting the residents and faculty and everyone else when it comes to these cases. And so one of the things is we just, we didn't really have a foreign body tray with all the stuff you needed. And so now we have foreign body trays. So now you just open it up and every bronchoscope that you would, and every piece of the bronchoscope that you need is in that box. And so you don't have to go search it around. Now you still have to check to make sure it works. And that is something that people sometimes forget to do. But, uh, and, and by checking the mean that it works, what do I mean? You got to plug the equipment in, right? You got to put it together and you got to plug it in and you have to look at the monitor and make sure that what you, you can see it. Cause I think sometimes we like, oh, this put together and they never look to, to actually see if they, once they turn the, the machine on, do you see an image on the screen? It is, or is it clear? You know, it's a bronchoscope, is the telescope in particular broken? Cause that, that happens. These are very you know, fine instruments and they can break easily. So anyway, so stuff like that, when you do the lab very often, you also start to get a feel because you're talking and you're getting feedback and like, hey, what can we do to make these cases easier? And then people are sometimes they just casually mention like, yeah, we were doing a farm body of the night and this happened. And you start to pay attention to those things like, oh yeah, well, what can I do to make that situation better? And I, and I would argue, also argue to anyone, or not argue, but recommend to anyone who's involved in education and your surgical practice. And we talked about this before where, you know, always believe that you can affect positive change. Always believe it because you can. And, but if you got to think about it and so you got to listen and you have to try to, you have to want to make things better. And if 
you know, recognize, like, so I recognized that the residents weren't getting a good experience with me in the operating room. And it was primarily because we didn't have time to really do good education. So it's like, okay, let's figure out a way where we can make an educational experience better. You know, residents say, oh, sometimes equipment's not working or it's missing or I'm having, you know, they, nobody can find stuff. Hmm. All right, let's put together Brock tray where everything's there. So now they don't have to look. It's all in the box. So anyway. Yeah. So that, that really highlights how simulation can kind of tie back into quality and safety and, you know, continuous improvement. You know, you're getting more opportunities to kind of go through these procedures and things. And so, and you have time to talk and reflect on it and, you know, come back and say, well, maybe we can be doing this better in the, when we're actually in the OR, which I think is another strong argument for, you know, to have simulation. So we talked about how we use simulation for airway form body, super high stakes, open airway, still high stakes, maybe not that the volume at which you're doing sinus surgery or a TNA. What about simulation for procedures that aren't as high volume? Is there a role for that? Like, should we be doing more simulation, you know, for routine things? Yeah, you know, that's a big topic at Academy every year. And if you follow other programs, websites, or their Twitter feed or their Instagram feed, they'll always have a, oh yeah, we had our simulation day and they'll practice like putting in tubes and packing noses and things like that. So I, I think they can do that. It's just not my area of expertise. I don't know. I just feel like, you know, packing a mannequin's nose. I mean, but it's like doing a DL on a mannequin. It's okay, but it's not the same as actually trying to stop something that's bleeding. Uh, so that's why I like the animal model, because it's a real tissue that you can work with. Uh, we are going to start a tracheostomy emergency simulation. And in this instance, we are going to use a high fidelity mannequin. It has a tracheostomy. You can stimulate tracheostomy plug and false passages and things like that. It's not quite the same as if you change a trach and it goes into a false track in a, you know, a real, like that soft tissue, you, you can't experience the different anatomies and things like that. But I think in that sense, we hope that it'll, it'll be able to teach residents how to, um, to handle that. Let me go back in terms of what is the, what is the theory behind simulation? And there, there's, there's many, but I think the main theory behind simulation is you're trying to teach people about adverse situations. So if you have a foreign body and you have trouble removing it, that's like a really an adverse situation. I think the sort of emergencies and things like that, I don't know if routine cases like say putting in a uh, tympanosomy tube, if that's as critical for the time and expense, maybe, but I'm not sure. Could you come up with a tonsillectomy model? The other thing is it's hard to find high fidelity models for things like for surgery. Like it's just, you need that, you need something, you need tissue to operate on. So you can do um, anatomy labs. So cadavers, certainly, but you know, obviously cadavers don't bleed. You know, I can't think of a good tympanosomy model that would stimulate the middle ear. They, they have some, but you know, they're, they're like, you know, you take a rubber, you know, you take a rubber glove and put it over a syringe and you practice cutting, you know, the rubber, you know, the rubber glove. I mean, yeah, it's sure. But in terms of that high fidelity, cause, cause we always compare it to like flying an airplane. That's the gold standard of simulation kind of thing. Or if you're running a nuclear power plant, can you simulate an emergency? But in this sense, you're really, you know, you're looking at knobs in, you know, readings it, you know, it's not like if there's a nuclear fallout that I guess, I mean, I guess eventually your face will burn, <laughs> but initially it's just going to be some numbers, right? Hey, the numbers are getting really high <laughs> where, you know, for a person in the operating room, there's actual, you know, there's bleeding, there's, there's the patient turns blue, the heart stops and you can feel it, you can see it. But clearly fidelity work, you know, high fidelity simulation has been shown to be effective for resuscitation and using mannequins. So I think in that sense, that's, I think that's where simulation works. If you're going to use a mannequin, it should be for 
just decision making, learning how to make decisions rapidly, almost like, you know, like we should just roll some dice and say, okay, you walk in a room, the kid's got a trade, you're going to do a trade change. All right, we're going to roll some dice. Okay. In this situation, you don't tell them, but okay, in this situation, they're going to have a mucus plug. Okay. Or you roll some dice and okay, in this situation, it's going to be a false track. Or in this situation, it's going to be no matter what they do, the patient's going to arrest. Let's see what they do. Do they remember like, oh yeah, the patient's arresting. Do they remember like, okay, you're supposed to run out the room and call for help. That may be the only lesson you want to give them. Yeah. Just, hey, if a patient arrests, first thing you do is get help. Everything else is mute. So I think that's where practicing high fidelity simulation is best. So emergency management, getting the brain sharp enough to remember how do you deal with a patient who's arresting. But other things in terms of surgeries, because I, you know, I asked the residents when we started doing this course, I said, well, what do you think about doing more simulation for neck dissection? And they were like, nah, we think we do enough. And um, there's really no way to simulate like tumor, like, or, you know, cutting a tumor off the jug. Yeah. Like, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I think there, it's kind of falls into two categories. You know, when you're focusing on simulating your decision-making capabilities during high stake, you know, emergency type situations, you don't necessarily need to have a perfect model. Like you said, you could roll dice, you can do, go through case discussions, you can have a mannequin that's, you know, reacting, but really it's about having gone through the exercise of thinking about, okay, what do I need to do so that when I'm in the real situation, I've thought about this before. Whereas, you know, with, with um, our simulation, you know, in our animal lab, it's, it's actually the the mechanics and the, you know, you're trying to practice more of the actual physical part of like, what am I doing with my hands and how do I, what are those subtle movements I can make, you know, with the instruments that give me mechanical advantage and that make me look like, um, I, I always remember Dr. Johnson, you're like, you got to look, look cool when you're doing it. Like if you're all hunched over, if you look like you're struggling, then you're doing it wrong. It shouldn't, it should, you should look like it's, make it look easy. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to look any other way. <laughs> you know, that's from Dr. That's from Doc. I, I got that from Dr. Mary Brandt. She is a pediatric surgeon. She was longtime Texas children faculty. And I think she's in New Orleans now. And she used to say, you know, what are the rules for being a surgeon? And the first rule is do what's right for the patient and look cool doing it. And, and she would say like, you know, you ever look at the people who really are good at operating, they always look cool when they do it. And yeah, you realize like, okay, when you kind of, when you've gotten good at something, you look cool. Yeah. You look like you know what you're doing. Yeah. And so if you're struggling to do something, it, it's one, you probably don't have mechanical advantage or it's hard. Sometimes it's just hard. You get a kid that's got no jaw. Everybody's going to struggle to get that airway. But it could also be that you're just not sure what to do. Like you haven't gotten proficient at the task and that's why you don't look cool. So we talked about simulation and residency training. How important do you think it is to continue simulation opportunities or training once you're in practice, uh, whether you're five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out? Yeah, I think that's a question that everybody's trying to answer. My best guess is maybe. <laughs> I don't, it's the prop. <laughs> it's it, so I think if you're involved in academics, you should be involved. You should be doing some simulation, and you should be the faculty doing simulation because it also helps you because you're teaching it, and now you're teaching it in a way that's safe, and you're in a safe environment, and you're also thinking about how people learn as a faculty member. So you're gaining knowledge from it. But if you are in private practice. Technically, you should be doing enough cases where you don't need the simulation for surgery, but you probably should be doing simulation for emergencies. Once a year, something like 